Well, the Sacramento Kings are off today, and apparently there's something big and important going on in the country, but I don't care. We're still talking Sacramento Kings basketball. After a 3-1 and one road trip, the Kings are home for the next two games. It's time for Sacramento to show that they can protect home court. Kenny Caraway, the KC and D'Lo and KC on ESPN 1320 joins me to talk about that. The Kings three-point shooting, the win in Miami, and more right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC Ten News. And I know there's a lot going on in the country today. I hope that Locked On Kings can provide you with maybe some relief from that if you need it, or a little bit of distraction, or or, or elsewhere entertainment outside of everything going on. But if you've chosen to spend your uh, election day listening to Locked on Kings at least a little bit, I really appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate your, uh, uh, your, your continued loyalty to this show. And let's have a little bit of fun talking the Sacramento Kings. And anytime I want to have fun, I bring this guy in. Kenny Caraway, the KC and D-Lo and KC. Hopefully you're a consistent listener to ESPN 1320's D-Lo and KC radio show from uh, noon to four every single weekday because these guys bring it, man. I, I love this show. I have the privilege of being a part of this show uh, every single week. Um, and these guys do such a phenomenal job breaking down Sacramento Kings basketball, San Francisco 49ers football, sports and culture and everything in between uh, in general. So anytime I can have either of them or both of them on the show, it's a real treat. Casey joins me right now to talk more about that Miami win, DeMontis Sabonis' game winner. Uh, and then we're going to dive into the Kings protecting home floor, right? Because last season we saw, uh, uh, and oh, actually over the last couple seasons, we've seen this Kings team do well on the road. And then they'll come back from a successful road trip. And a lot of times that first home game, they'll lay a bit of an egg. So can this Kings team overcome that and protect home floor of these next two games against the Raptors and Clippers on Wednesday and Friday? Casey joins me to talk about that. We talk about the three-point shooting as well. Uh, so I hope you enjoy my conversation with Kenny Carraway. I don't know about y'all, but the buzz from last night, Sacramento Kings victory in Miami still hasn't worn off. Hopefully Kenny Caraway feeling the same way. KC from d and KC on ESPN 1320 joining me here on Locked on Kings. Kenny, uh, I made the joke. I was actually out at a basketball game last night. I was at a, high, uh, a college basketball game and I was watching the game on my phone. And when mm. Domas hit that, that, that put back kind of off one foot fader game winner, my face looked like the Dwayne Wade statue. Like I, 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 popped, <laughs> I popped inside of, uh, I was at the University of Pacific uh, basketball game in Stockton. Man, that just a, a great moment for Domas specifically. Extra sweet against a guy like Bam Adebayo. But you and uh, D uh, Lo have been talking about it all day on D Lo and KC today. I'm stealing a little yeah. bit more of your time. How was your what was your reaction to to that ending? Another wild, close ending. The Kings have been in a lot of those already so far this season. Mm -hmm. No, they have, man. I, I had the same reaction. I'm sure uh, all of Sacramento had when Demontis got that rebound, had to fall away, all net. Uh, I, matter of fact, I, I was like Malik Monk and Demar Derozan. I was like on the ground, like piss uh, pump fisting, and then you know about to pick him up, you know, through the TV or something like that. But it, it was amazing. What a finish that was! I, I my my shoulder just sank. When Jimmy Butler hit, I think only his second three pointer of the season. He's not a three point shooter, but turnabout is fair play because I'm sure a lot of Heat fans felt the same way DeMar when DeMar DeRozan got that four point play. Like, what is he doing hitting three pointers? But I mean, big shots were made all over the place. I know it's the, what was it, the seventh game of the season, but that, that felt like a big win. That yeah. felt like a big win. And it felt like they felt like it was a big win as well. When you hear about, you know, how they, you know, had to talk to each other during halftime, how they came out and played in the second half, and then the emotion they showed uh when the game concluded and, and Sabonis got that victory and, and got that bucket. So 
um, they felt like it was a big game. And, uh, man, it's glad, glad to get away with a win there. There was a big win for a number of different reasons. Number one is historically Miami for the Kings has been a very difficult place to play. I think that's only like the sixth time ever that the Kings have won in Miami <laughs> or, or something like that. Like it's been a very, very tough place for the Sacramento Kings to win. And not only that, you left on this road trip with a losing record. You're coming home with mm. a winning record. And that win mm. is the difference between a two and two road trip, which is still good. Anytime you can go 500 on a road trip is great. But a three and one road trip that yeah. when it, it very easily could have been four and oh with that yeah. overtime game yeah. in Toronto, man, that the difference in that optically and, and then how you feel coming home, three and one's a big difference than two and two. Yeah, and, and you know what, Matt? I, the road trip is definitely a marker for sure. But I pushed this out a little further after the Lakers game. I looked at those six games, you know, starting with the game at home against Portland. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the four game road trip. And then you've got this game tomorrow night against the Toronto Raptors. And I said, in those six games, I need you guys to do a little bit of work. I'm, I'm just one of the things I do. Maybe it's a defense mechanism, whatever. I never say undefeated. You know, it's the NBA. I always look for, um, you know, possibly a loss here or there. But I said, man, if you can find a way to come out of those six games at four and two, possibly five and one, that's how you can kick start your season. And they've already secured the fourth win of those six games. And they have a great opportunity on Wednesday night at the Golden One Center to make it five and one in those six games. And it and winning those, you know, five games or four games or whatever, it's not going to make the season perfect but it's a it's a good way after an old two start to kick start your season get back on a winning path do a little bit more than just keeping your head above water and start to uh start to rack up some wins as you start to learn each other as a team i'm gonna go a bit out of order here because i wasn't planning on talking about this until later on but it makes sense to touch on it right now this was the thing about this king's team over the last couple of years is they would have really good road trips and play really well on the road and then mm. they'd come back to Sacramento, and and typically in that first game back, they, they'd they struggle a little bit. So here's a really important opportunity for them to prove that they've kind of worked past that. They have their chance at revenge against Toronto, who was the only team to beat them on mm. this road trip, a very gettable game. And then the L.A. Clippers, too. This team is not very uh, very established yet, right, with the, the injuries right. and things that they're dealing with early on in this season. So here are two games staring you right in the face at home and a chance to uh, uh, get another three-game win streak going and go six and three back on the road when you head out to Phoenix. So these, no, these next two home games, I think are going to tell us a lot about this Kings team too, and how they've improved from years past. No, nah, absolutely. Look, look here. We all got humble hearts. We all have gone through everything with the Kings, you know, losing games. They were so quote unquote supposed to win and all this other stuff. So we're apprehensive, <laughs> but I say it like this, if the Kings are who, we thought they were. I won't speak for everybody who I thought they were. A floor of 52 wins, that type of game. There's nothing wrong with saying, yes, you need to handle business against the Raptors. Yes, you should handle business against the Raptors and the Clippers at the crib. Like there, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying that. And I think they feel the same way in that locker room. You know what I mean? And that's probably the most important thing is they look at it as we should take care of business. I think the difference between this year and last year, though, is I think at times they thought if we just show up, it'll all fall into place. This year, I think they're a little bit more committed to the process, so to speak. They're a little bit more committed to staying locked in, staying focused and showing some adversity, fighting through whether it's a bad start or bad schedule or bad travel or whatever the case may be fighting through that and handling business. I think this team is a lot more locked in on handling business on a night-to-night -night basis. And to your point, DeMontis Sabonis shared in his post-game interview last night that apparently there was a pretty heated conversation that happened in the locker room at halftime after the Sacramento mm -hmm. Kings put together a really disappointing first half in Miami. And then they exploded in that third quarter and turned, what, like a 15-point deficit into a nine-point lead uh, at one point, yeah. completely turned things around. Mike Brown talked about it a little bit post game too. But what does that say to you? Because I know some Sacramento Kings fans have had issue with the demeanor of a guy like De'Aaron Fox after a loss, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we haven't necessarily always seen those those heated moments of uh, like accountability between players mm -hmm. or between coaches or coaches and players or whatever. Sometimes we'll see like Malik and Mike go at it, but really not not too often. Just because we're not seeing it doesn't mean it isn't happening. And here we hear about right. this this meeting that happened at halftime, and then we see the results directly after that meeting. So clearly, obviously, these guys care. 
No, absolutely. They've always cared. I, I you know, want to tell everybody that they've always cared, even when it felt like they didn't or they were nonchalant. But this year and in this moment right here, it tells me that they're taking this extremely serious. Mm-hmm. They, it's the only seventh game of the season. Yeah, I mean, look, um, do you think the Pistons or excuse me, the Lakers were yelling at each other and they're in the ha- at the half in their game against the Pistons? Probably not because LeBron has been here forever. He knows it's the sixth, seventh game of the season. But in Sacramento, in that locker room, they're taking every game seriously, and there's a sense of urgency for every game. And there's a sense of urgency, most importantly, to take advantage of opportunities that are presented in front of you. You talked about the road trip, an opportunity to have a three and one road trip, an opportunity as I stretch this thing out to talk about uh, a four and two, five and one in a six game stretch, and they take it seriously. And I like to hear that. I like to see those things. I like to see them have a sense of urgency about what's going on at the time. The way they closed out, I think more than just um, the first half, the way they closed out that second quarter was absolutely disastrous. I think with about two minutes to go, it was a two-point game. The Heat go into the half up 11, I think 11 or 12 or something like that. And and that was just unacceptable. And yeah, there's going to be some some talking about that if I'm on that roster with the way we finished out that half. Even more importantly, the way they played in that third quarter, you could see the intensity rise on both ends of the floor. And that's a testament to those guys. That's a testament not only to somebody speaking up, but the people being responsive to that, the the rest of the teammates and everybody in that locker room being responsive to the things that we're saying and going out and making a difference and not taking it personally, saying, you know what, they're right, let's turn this up. And they did absolutely that. That third quarter was fantastic. Maybe one of their best quarters of the season so far. This episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Built Rewards. Real talk, we've all been there, feeling like we're burning cash with those rent checks. It's frustrating, right? Especially here in California. But here's the deal. Built Rewards has figured out a way to make rent more rewarding. Say goodbye to the money bonfire and hello to a renter's revolution with Built. Built is breaking ground as a neighborhood rewards program that hooks you up with points on your rent. Every month, pay your rent and watch the bill points roll in. You can use points to jet off on a dream vacation, put your points towards a flight or hotel stay with 500 plus airlines and 700,000 plus hotels and properties. You can also use your points to book fitness studio classes, redeem them towards a future rent payment. They're designed to meet your lifestyle. Pay rent hassle-free through the Built Rewards app. Your rent gain just got a major upgrade. Built points have been consistently ranked the highest value point currency by the points guy and bank rate. Earn points by paying your rent right now when you go to joinbuilt.com slash locked on NBA. That's J-O-I-N-B-I-L-T dot com slash locked on NBA. Make sure to use that URL so they know that we sent you. Join built.com slash locked on NBA to start earning points with your rent payments today. And Locked on Kings is also brought to you by our friends at Game Time. This is the app that you need to be using to buy your Sacramento Kings tickets. I checked this morning, tickets for the Kings and Raptors and the Kings Clippers. There are some killer deals already on Game Time. And here's the best thing about Game Time. The closer you get to the game, the better those deals are going to get. They have their flash deals that can't be beat. Prices are cut uh, as you get closer and closer to the event, depending upon the demand of the tickets and what is available. They have this game time picks feature that filters through all of the tickets that are available and only shows you the best deals by different zones. They're all in pricing is this feature that's so simple and yet so important. It shows you the price up front, no last second hidden fees and that final page of checkout that it just punches you in the face when you feel like you're paying one thing and then suddenly it's $30, $40 more. Their seat views cannot be beat. So whether you're buying tickets to a Kings game inside the Golden One Center or a different sporting event, a concert, uh, a theatrical production, a comedy show, whatever it is, get those tickets on game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NBA for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. What do you make of all of the close games that the Kings have been in so far? In their three losses, right? Lost by two to Minnesota. Lost by four to LA. Lost by three to Toronto in overtime. They're, they're, the, mm-hmm. the wins, when they have the, the largest margin of, of victory, or just the largest separation period was when they won 111 to 98 in Portland and 113 mm-hmm. to 96 in Utah. Other than that, I mean, the Atlanta game, the Kings won by eight, but we know that game was close in the fourth quarter and then winning by one in Miami. Like, 
this Kings team is just locked in these tight games to where if they're ahead big, with the exception of those other two games, if they're ahead big, they are allowing their opponents back in. But if they're falling mm. behind by a, a decent amount, they're continuing to fight, come back, and consistently make a game of it at the end. Seven games into a season with a relatively still new group getting used to each other. What do you make of all these close games so far? We talked about this uh, yesterday because I, I have taken notice of the fact that a couple of different things, right? So first, we'll start with the fact that when they're down, whether, wherever it's at in the game, they don't seem to give up on themselves, give up on the game. The Toronto game is a perfect example. I, I have some notes or whatever, and about five or six times in the notes for that game, I said, yeah, this one looks like it's over. You know what I mean? It looks like they don't have it tonight. Or, you know, man, big shot by R.J. Barrett. It looks like you could put this one away. And every time they respond with a 7-8-0 run, something like that. And I think that's a positive. You can only take that as a positive. I think some people will look at it as you shouldn't be down that much to the Raptors or anything. But look. These are NBA players. I knew on Saturday the Raptors were going to give their best effort with the Vince Carter retirement and the energy that was going on in that building. And the Kings were resilient to that. They were resilient in that Lakers game when it looked like that game was finished with about two minutes to go. And they got it to a point where they had an opportunity to be two, two points down with under 30 seconds to go or something. So I take it as a positive. Absolutely take it as a positive. The other thing that I noticed outside of the Atlanta game, um, which – Got a little weird. Like they were handling that game, and then there was some calls and some momentum, momentum swings. And Garrison Matthews turned into uh, the prime Clay Thompson out of nowhere. I don't know what the hell that was all about. But th other than the Atlanta game and Toronto, obviously, the teams that they're better than, I think they're going to handle relatively easily all year. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of close games against teams that, at least on paper, aren't on their caliber. I think they'll wear those teams down eventually. I think they'll suffocate them. And you're going to see more times than not them winning 12, 15 points in those type of games. The games of the teams that are potential playoff teams and good teams, I think you're always going to see them battle. I think you're always going to see them in a close game. Obviously, there'll be a night where it just it's not falling and maybe they you know lose in blowout fashion. But I think for the most part, you're going to see these guys fight against those good teams and beat those good teams more times than not. And against the teams that aren't quote unquote good, I think they're going to handle them relatively easy more times than not. And it all goes back to the focus that this team seems to have uh, this year and the accountability that they, they have for themselves every time they step on the floor. So I, I expect big things from this team this year. Another theme of these first seven games is, how this team is played when they are ahead. I mean, they gave up that big run, the 20 to seven run in game one versus Minnesota, the 21 0 run by the Lakers to start the fourth quarter. That was kind of an anomaly because that was LeBron James just going crazy, but still another big right. run that the Kings gave up. I know they won in Atlanta, but they gave the Hawks, like you talked about that big run to get Atlanta back into it to where Atlanta almost stole that game uh, in the mm -hmm. fourth quarter after the Kings were in control for most of the time. Do you feel any type of way about how the Sacramento Kings are playing when they have the lead, or does it just come down to basketball is a game of runs, teams are going to go on these runs at some point, and the Kings just need to be ready to right the ship when they're in the middle of that storm? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't feel any type of way um, right now. Uh, the Minnesota game, Minnesota just a good team. Ant-Man, you know, one of the best players in the world, he made sure – uh, they were at least going to have a chance in that game. And Julius Randle went crazy as well. The Lakers game, they got LeBron. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was that was, that was was just ridiculous, the, <laughs> what we saw from LeBron James. The Atlanta game is a head-scratcher. I'm not exactly sure. Like I said, in the third quarter, towards the end of the third quarter, some of the, some of the calls kind of went against the Kings and, and things unraveled for about a four or five minute span, but that's a head scratcher. I look at that as the exception and not the rule. And I know there's been different times throughout middle, the middle of these games against Portland and Utah, there's been runs, but that's the NBA. And I, I think more times than not, they're going to be able to mitigate any of those runs, especially once they start to feel comfortable with what they're trying to do on the offensive end with DeMar DeRozan being added to the fold. And now you got Sabonis and Fox and all these other guys. I, I think by virtue of DeMar and his ability to get to the line a lot of the times, and hopefully that rubbing off on a guy like De'Aaron Fox and him able to being able to get to the line as well, I think we'll see less and less of those type of runs. 
that allow teams back into games when they have big leads. I think we're going to see more so what we saw against Utah, you know, where they're up and they just kind of keep pouring it on. Maybe they slow the pace down a little bit, but more times than not, uh, I think we'll see a team that that handles big leads and, and really doesn't give them away too often. This episode of Locked on Kings is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place bets on NFL games, but also NBA games, college athletics right now, NHL games, everything all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. It's all right there for you on FanDuel.com. So join today, and when you join, you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. So take $5 and put it on the most surefire thing that you can find, the biggest favorite that you can find. Because even if that bet itself doesn't pay out very much, you get $150 in bonus bets where you can really start to make some cash and have some fun on FanDuel. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Today's episode of the Long Time Kings podcast is also brought to you by Hims, Guys, Sometimes intimate moments happen spontaneously, and we always want to be ready so we can perform in the bedroom, right? Hims provides access to treatments that can help you stay hard and last longer, giving you that boost of confidence so you can be ready whenever the mood strikes. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you with access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. Hims provides an access to a range of doctor trusted ed treatments like chewable hard mints and viagra cialis and their generics for up to 95 percent cheaper the process is 100 online so there's no need for those uncomfortable doctor's visits just answer a series of questions on their site and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option if prescribed uh, prescribed rather your medication will ship directly to you in discreet packaging for free. No insurance is needed and one low price covers everything from treatments to ongoing care with hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers. Hims can help you find the ED option that works for you. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash locked on. That's H I M S.com slash locked on to personalize uh, your ED treatment options. Hims.com slash locked on. The products mentioned are chewable compound products, which are not approved by or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription is required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Well, even in Utah, what I thought the Kings did really, really well in Utah, KC, is there were there were stretches and there were moments where Utah went on these little pushes, these little 6-0 mm-hmm. runs, 8-0 runs to kind of make a game of it. And the Kings always responded in those games. And I'm not saying runs yeah. are, are never going to happen because every team's going to put together, string together some stretch of, of baskets to try and make a little bit of a push. But what it felt like in Utah is every single time, it's kind of how I felt on the opposite end in Toronto. Every single time Utah made a little bit of a push and got back into the game, Sacramento mm-hmm. shut it down really, really quickly. And that was right. kind of what happened in Toronto too. The Kings would go on these little 6-0, runs, and then R.J. Barrett hit a big shot. Or Toronto would take mm-hmm. a timeout and then come out of that timeout on a 6-0 run, right? And that's so frustrating to be on the wrong side of it. It feels really good mm-hmm. to be on the right side of it. One mm-hmm. thing I do feel a certain type of way about is the three-point shooting. This was an issue that went back into preseason. A lot of people were hoping, I think, that it would just get better with one, the regular season, two, the return of Kevin Herter. Herter not being out over these last two games clearly had an impact on this Kings team. Herter shooting 37% from three-point range. But, KC, what I can't make sense of is this stat that the Sacramento Kings are, and I, I'm, I'm pulling it up in front of me so I get it right. In terms of open threes, which is when a defender is within four to six feet or four to six feet away from a King shooter, the Kings are 24 of 101, 23.8%. This team is just missing open threes. Now, wide open, this is important context, wide open when the Kings are, when there's not a defender within six feet of the Kings, they're 41% at 50 of 120. So when they're wide, wide open, they're making threes at a respectable clip. But those open threes, which is what this offense in DeMar DeRozan is going to generate a lot of with the mid-range, the Kings aren't hitting those shots. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping it's just a cold start to the season and the Kings can shoot their way through it. But I remember talking about similar things at times and stretches 
last season too. So mm -hmm. at this point, I'm not panicking, Casey. I am a little concerned about the inconsistency of the three-point shooting and that kind of hamstringing what is supposed to be a very lethal offense with the shooters that on paper they've surrounded DeRozan and Fox with. What do you make of the three-point shooting through seven games? No, I'm with you, man. And, and it's a situation like you mentioned. I'm not panicking about it, but I, I'm going to tell you I'm aware of it. You know, I'm aware of it. I'm watching it. And one of the things you, you speak in my language is one of the things I always bug our guy Will Z about when they have cold spells shooting the three and everything. I said, let me see if they're still getting the shots from a wide open and open perspective, because if they're still getting those shots at the same rate that they are when they're making a bunch of threes, I can rest a little easier because sure. that lets me know offense is still working. And I just kind of put my, you know, put my faith in the fact that you're getting open and wide open looks still consistently. Eventually, the averages are going to do what the averages do, and you're going to start hitting those. And that's kind of where they're at right now. They're still generating those same shots. The offense is working to a T for what you're trying to do, the shots that you're trying to get. They're just not going down. And like you said, I'm not panicking about it, but I am aware of it. And I'm I'm going on faith i'm going on uh averages you know and how averages work that they'll turn that around and eventually by the time that we get halfway through the season we're going to see percentages of them with open shots around low 40s and wide open shots of mid 40s because that's what these nba players do but um i am aware of it you know dear dear fox has been up and down with his three point shooting we saw the o of 11 the other night in toronto me and Damian talk about it all the time. I understand that it's been a while since he hurt that finger, and it's something that I believe that you just kind of get used to and you work mm -hmm. around. But it 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 has to have an effect. It's sure. it can't work the same exact way sure. as if you didn't injure it. So I wonder if he's still in the adjustment period for that. Keegan Murray, who I brought up uh, yesterday on the show, who I think has been really really good. Uh, to start the season. I think he's played really well on both ends of the floor. He's rebounding well. His three-point shooting has been a little down, and that's right. uh, kind of perplexing to me because I feel like he's getting a lot of wide-open looks, and they're just not going down. I have faith that he's going to turn that around. And then, like you said, when Kevin Herter gets back into the fold um, and the way that he was shooting before he went down with, uh, with the illness, um, I think that'll help out as well. So all things considered, reiterate your point. I'm not panicking, but it is on my radar. Again, I'll, I'll go back to those numbers that I read. Everybody's going to look at the shooting percentage and how many shots that they're making. But like you said, they are generating these. I mean, in seven games, KC, they've generated 101 open threes where a defender really was good. between four or six feet away. In seven games, 120 yeah. wide open threes. Wow. So they're Jesus. generating a lot of these looks. They're just not yeah. falling. But that means, like you said, the offense is working, right? You have, And it, it mm -hmm. was supposed to with a guy like DeMar out there and then with De'Aaron Fox as well and the amount of tension they're drawing. So if those shots, it, it feeds into the belief that you and I have shared all along. If slash when those shots start falling, there's nothing you can do because teams mm -hmm. are forced to gamble of well, I got to send an extra defender to help on DeMar or I got to just foul DeMar or try and go straight one-on-one -on -one right. with DeMar or risk leaving an open shooter open. Right now, they're, the Kings aren't making opponents pay enough for that gamble. But if they can, mm -hmm. like that's where Kevin Durant's going back on his podcast and going, I don't, I don't know how to defend these guys. Right, right. No, I, and and it's, it's, it's one of those things where I'm giving them still, and I think the offenses look fantastic. I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I know they're probably one of the top, scoring teams in the league. top 10 i think last time i looked um a couple of games ago but I, I think the offense is working i think there's another level they can reach it goes with what you're talking about hitting these open threes which will add to the point total and the efficiency but it also goes to like i said another 10 games or so maybe eight games or so of just understanding what they want to do in the offense with demar Derozan. we all know sabonis fox monk keegan they've been together for multiple years but you're adding a major piece in demar Derozan, who plays a little different than you're used to you know he plays in the mid-range area he's not a guy that spreads the floor with the three-point shot so it takes a little bit of time to get used to playing with a guy like that and He's that good. So it's like, oh, we can't just ignore him and just, you know, he's got to fit into us. No, what he's doing works. What he's doing is is bringing home the bacon right now. So you've got to adjust a little bit to make sure that he's still getting his opportunities. And like I said, I'm giving it the first 10, 15 games of the season to kind of get used to what you're doing. And once they get past that, Matt, 
I think they about to take off. I think they about to take off. You talk about getting used to each other and these open shots and wide open shots falling at a clip that's more reasonable. Yeah, they about to cook. They going to cook. Well, Casey, while they're getting used to each other, the Kings and Denver Nuggets are tied for the sixth uh, offense in terms of points per game, 118.3 mm. points per game. For context, Indiana, the Pacers are fifth at 118.4. So they're 0.1 behind the Indiana Pacers, who was the number one offense last year. Boston's yeah. at number one at 123.6 points per game. <laughs> but what I, they're crazy. But what I like, though, is when you look at point differential, the Sacramento mm. Kings are fifth behind the four hottest teams in the NBA, which is OKC, Golden State, Boston, and Cleveland. So mm. even, I mean, the offense is really, really good, but the defense has been solid enough. And, and I, that state, uh, that stat, I think, kind of also uh, correlates with the eye test of what we're seeing is whether it's the first half last night in Miami. I know it got out of control a little bit towards the end. Like I point to the first half against Portland and Sacramento. That game was played in the freaking mud and neither team could get going <laughs> offensively. And the Kings maintained a lead the entire time until their offense woke up in the third quarter. The defense yeah. still has issues, especially with defending the three-point shot. That's a big issue that this team still has to clean up. But defensively, this team is doing enough consistently to keep themselves in games if the if the shot isn't falling. And that that's mm -hmm. encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it really is. And you know, another thing that I've kind of got my eye on, and I don't want to say this is a staple of this team just yet, because I want to see more from it. But if you if you if you really look and you remember these games, these third quarters, yes, they they come out a different way yes. than what we've seen in the first quarter and what we've seen from third quarters in the past from Sacramento teams. You, the only game that I could think of off the top of my head where they didn't really kind of push the gas in that third quarter was the Toronto game. And that's because Vince Carter took about seven hours to do his, uh, his Jersey retirement with all due respect. I love Vince sanity, but my goodness, I think he's still talking right now as we speak, but outside of that game, the third quarters have been lethal for the Kings. And I want to see if that continues. Like I said, I'm not going to put that as who they are just yet, but I'm aware of it. Just like the shooting that we talked about, I'm aware of what they do in these third quarters. And I want to see if that continues. You're not alone, KC, because I talked about that last night on the podcast. The Kings are number three in third quarter scoring. They're averaging almost 32, mm. 31.9 points per game in the third quarter. For context, Golden mm. State and Chicago are one and two at both around 33 points per game the kings are also shooting as a team over 50 percent i think it's like wow. 51 or 52 percent in the third quarter the third quarter historically has been a tough quarter for sacramento coming out of the game yeah. struggling with adjustments what that tells me is one whatever conversations are happening in the locker room are working two i think mm -hmm. that's a sign of good coaching too because mike brown is making adjustments as well if the kings are a really really good third quarter team and they're not it's not like they're getting off to bad starts either the third quarter right. is absolutely been a strength of this Kings team so far, and I think it should be paid attention to. No, I've, I, absolutely. And you talk about the coach, and Mike Brown deserves the credit because he, he's the head guy for sure. We all know DC does a great job. But I talked about this yesterday on the show, and and I I haven't talked to the man. I I, I don't. It's more than just, I guess it's just a feeling. Like I, I just kind of picture him, and I see what's going on, and I I watch him on the on the bench, and I watch different clips and everything. I think Luke Louts has been fantastic to start 100%. the season. I, I think he's a hell of a coach. I think he's going to be on the fast track to being a head coach at some point. And when you talk about adjustments and you talk about doing things differently coming out of the out of the locker room at halftime, I think Luke Louts probably has a lot to do with that as well, man. Because I, I just think just been watching him, man, and I think he's a heck of a coach. And you talk about those adjustments, I think he he gets a uh, a tip of the cap for that as well. You're 100% spot on. I have had the opportunity to speak to Luke Lauks, and I hope you and D'Lo get the opportunity to speak with him, KC, because he's mm -hmm. amazing to talk to, a wealth of knowledge. He is a guy that is so instrumental in the development, especially shooting-wise, of De'Aaron Fox alone. Like, he and mm -hmm. De'Aaron Fox, since Mike Brown came to Sacramento and brought Luke Lauks with him, De'Aaron and Luke have been attached at the hip, right, to where mm -hmm. Luke was with De'Aaron at times on his, uh, on his uh, honeymoon uh yeah. luke uh, we got the opportunity to cover it at De'Aaron fox's basketball camp luke hosted kind of a a workout for fox at the basketball camp and getting to see how like so luke is very instrumental there and then we've gotten the opportunity to kind of watch luke take over this defense and now the defense is still rocky for sure mm -hmm. and he's got mm -hmm. huge shoes to fill and jordy fernandez who's the head coach now of the the brooklyn nets but luke has been 
fantastic as well. DC is the guy. It's it's weird to think that uh, historically, like two to three in the NBA, and uh, Doug Christie is the guy that's working with Demontis Sabonis every day. But that's the case. Domas is working with yeah. DC and Leandro Barbosa, two guards, but they've yeah. helped Demontis Sabonis, I think, significantly with his Absolutely. scoring and just his overall ability too. So. This this coaching staff that Mike Brown has assembled here in Sacramento is extremely, extremely underrated. And that includes the guys that have moved on, not just Jordy to Brooklyn, but I mean, uh, Lindsey Harding, who now is, is yep. on J.J. Reddick's bench in Los Angeles, right? Like this coaching staff in Sacramento has been phenomenal, too. And a, and a good yeah. sign of how good it is is the amount of teams that are trying to pick talent away from it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and I I don't want to forget my guy Jay Triano too because I I'm always yes. a big fan of Jay Triano and what he does on the offensive end. And he um he doesn't. A lot of people kind of made a lot. Oh, he was Demar Derozan's first coach or whatever. Demar Derozan's a little bit of a different player since then. Jay Triano's probably a different coach, but I think Jay has also done a great job of being able to implement the strengths of Demar Derozan within the Kings offense that was already there. And I give him credit for that as well. Like you mentioned, this coaching staff is top notch, I think. All right, we, we're going to wrap up with this, Casey. The broad answer to this question is, of course, Kings wins or better shooting or whatever. But we get we get two games, two glimpses of the Kings in person here in Sacramento after this road trip. Give me one okay. thing specifically that you, you would like to see in this game or in either of these games, just something that you want to see in person from this team, whether it's from a player specifically, or just one, one element that you would like to see. I want to, I want to see a couple of comfortable wins. You know, you went on a, on a road trip, you had some close games. The last two games obviously were really, really close. I want to see you against a Raptors team that I don't think is very good right now. And against a Clippers team that I don't think is very good right now. I want to see something that resembles more of Portland and, and Utah and not only see those games because it'll just make life easier for everybody that's watching, but I also want to see you have the minutes that you got were able to get for Sabonis and DeRozan and Fox in those games. Mid to low 30s as opposed to high, or excuse me, low 40s in the other games because, you know, they were so close. So I, I want to see a couple of comfortable wins before you take on, you know, a team that's surging right now in Phoenix. Um, but you got two teams that we mentioned earlier in the show that you should be better than at the very least at this point in the season, you should be able to take care of. You built some momentum off that three and one road trip. Go ahead and continue that momentum by handling two teams that you think are lesser than uh, in, a, in a relatively easier fashion. So I want to see two comfortable wins uh, in these next two games. Hopefully we see that, Casey. I appreciate you taking the time here on Locked On Kings, especially after not just your uh, your your sports radio show. People forget you you on the music radio side as well with the things right. that, that you and D'Lo <laughs> do. Before I let you go, too, r remind the people real quick because you and K uh, you and D'Lo have a event coming up at Sky River Casino next week, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, man. Monday, November 11th. It's Veterans Day, so a lot of people aren't working. Come on down to Sky River Casino. We're going to be doing a live show. Uh, the show that comes on before us, The Insiders, with my guys Kyle Matson and James Ham. They're also going to be doing their show. So ESPN 1320 is going to be there all day long. And then, if you can't necessarily make it for the show, Kings play the Spurs that night. We'll be there watching that game at 32 Bruce Street. It's going to be a good time out, man. So uh, make sure you come on down if you got the opportunity to Sky River Casino next Monday, November 11th. Come holler at us. Come hang out with us. And if it makes any difference to Kings fans, I'm planning on coming through too just to check it out. And oh, it's lit. Out. It's like, a party now. It's always a it's good a party time. now. It's always yeah, a yeah, good yeah. time with Casey Take over <laughs> Sky River Casino. Casey, I appreciate you, my man. We'll do this again very, very soon, my guy. Light the beam, brother, and uh, we'll talk soon. Anytime, my guy. I appreciate you.